Okay, we've uh, come back for our break, so we're going to continue the presentation now. Uh, so we're going to move to our next learning objective. As I said, uh, we've got several to hit today. The next one that we're going to hit is going to be describing structural search and rescue operations. So it encompasses uh, a number of things, but all of these uh, things listed here are all things that relate to uh, your need to understand things for structural search. So understanding search preparation, safety guidelines, fire isolation procedures, search markings, primary and secondary search techniques, and other search methods are all things that we're going to talk about and things that you should be familiar with in order for you to accurately understand structural searches. To prepare yourself for your search, understand who you report to. If you are a firefighter on a crew, you report to an officer. If you're in a large structure on a crew as a captain, you may be reporting to a uh, specific division, maybe the person in charge of the seventh floor of a hospital. And if you're that person in charge of the seventh floor of the hospital, you may be reporting to the incident commander directly. So understand, like most things, uh, there's definitely a chain of command and a hierarchy as it relates to something as simple as a task like search. Make sure your portable radio is turned on, working, and set to the correct channel. Um, for us, that means after being assigned to tactical channel, we move to uh, TAC 2 or Brown. Uh, or we could go to Gray or TAC 3 or any number of channels that we have access to. Make sure you're on the right one. Be listening for that so that you know when to do that so that you're, you're not left on the repeated channel and not the tactical channel. Make sure that your SDBA is turned on, working, and contains a full cylinder there before you enter the environment. Again, when we come in on shift change, we check our packs, we put, them on, we put our mask on, we make sure the pack functions, the regulator functions, we make sure we got a full bottle, and then we also, also uh, verify that our pass device is uh, able to function. We let it sit for a while, we let it activate, and then we disengage it. So uh, do those things before you also are uh, sent into search. Know your assigned duties and tactical objectives. If you're assigned primary search, your job is not fire attack. If you're primary search, you are primary search. Be aware of alternate means of egress. Um, if we were searching on the second floor and we had a situation where the door behind us was compromised or we had a compromise of the stairwell behind us, what is a secondary mean of egress? A secondary mean of egress. A fire escape. A fire escape, yes. Um, or on the back side of the house, what else could it be? Window. Just a window, a simple window. Very good. Um, gather knowledge of a building's floor plan. You're going to be limited in your ability to do this in the heat of the moment. However, this is where territory training comes into play and uh, pre-incident surveys come into play. If you're at a high, uh, high risk facility or you're at a uh, address that you come to frequently uh, or you've done a, a fire inspection there, that may give you a leg up. The public can also help you. If it's someone's house, then they may say, hey, just a heads up, there's a stairwell right inside to the right that goes down to the basement. You wouldn't want to take one step in the house and tumble down the stairs. So uh, there's a number of ways to do that. If you get real good and uh, competent with your building construction knowledge, you can also look at a house and get a very general idea of what rooms are where. You might be able to identify a kitchen versus a bathroom versus a bedroom just by looking from the outside. Uh, so that's a, that will be a skill that comes with experience. Make sure you have all the necessary tools and equipment. Uh, your agency's... Uh, SOPs may vary, uh, but we have uh, tools that we typically bring in. What are some, some tools that we bring in on uh, primary searches? Marion set. Yeah, Marion set, very Sometimes good. Sometimes a water can. Sometimes a water can. Uh, right angle lights that uh, come on some of the newer trucks, if, if not a light that you had personally purchased yourself. Box lights that every truck has, things like that. Very good. So uh, building floor plans, I kind of touched on this. We do uh, company level inspections. We do pre-incident surveys of uh, high hazard buildings. Architectural plans, I can tell you anecdotally, uh, on the truck that I work on, we have architectural plans for a University of Missouri arena. So we have floor by floor blueprints of what's everywhere and what the dimensions of those rooms are. Uh, so you know, your truck may or may not have those things, but those are things that if you have access to, you should have with you. Uh, that personal observation, of course, we talked about being able to identify some of those construction features just from a glance. Tour buildings that are under construction, uh, we uh, as the fire department are often out and about. There's always construction going on in any city or town in the United States, uh, pretty much at any time. So if you have a place under construction, go check it out because it may be in a, it may be, uh, in a state where it's just framing. You can take a look at what the framing is, what building typing it is, 
what unique features it may have, and then you can check a site visit later when it's got you know walls up, sheetrock up, things like that. Uh, so uh, concrete block walls have been built, all sorts of things like that can give you an idea of what the building floor plans may be, and you just never know what building you're going to end up in. So trying to encompass and hit as many buildings as you can at company level inspections or tours is always a good idea for that reason. Uh, checking out ones in your own run box are a smart idea. Here we've got pictures of a hotel and a house. So we don't necessarily go and do home inspections. That We actually specifically don't do home inspections. Uh, however, we go to a lot of EMS calls. We go to people's houses all the time. And we see the inside of a lot of houses. So while it's entirely possible that we may end up responding to a structural rescue emergency in a house that we've been to on an EMS call, also bear in mind that in a lot of uh, newer neighborhoods, you have maybe 300 houses in a neighborhood, but five floor plans. So if you've been in three of those houses, you may have seen most of the floor plans that that neighborhood even offers. So you may have an idea going in, this house looks just like one that I know would run a medical call in. I know to expect a staircase immediately on the left when I go in. Or I know the stairwell's front is right in front of me when I walk in and it goes straight up. Or these are all split levels. I know this is where this is going to go. Uh, so always try to remember the things that you see when you're out because you just never know where you're going to end up. The tools and equipment that you want to bring, uh, we did touch on that. Uh, we talked about personal lights, uh, flashlights, force electric tools. We did not talk about uh, ladders, uh, search ropes, hose lines, and thermal imagers. Uh, we are going to talk a little more specifically about thermal imagers. Uh, we can use them to see through heat sources, uh, through darkness and smoke. We can use them to locate victims in hidden fire. And most importantly, how they operate, they identify temperature differentials. So it doesn't necessarily see heat, it sees the difference in heat. So as you can see there in that photo, uh, we can see what looks like an outline of a human uh, type shape. So it's not necessarily seeing the heat of the human, it's actually seeing the relative difference in that human versus the environment around him. So uh, it doesn't always manifest itself with a dark background with a white body. Sometimes it may be a white background with a dark body. It just depends on the temperature differential and what that uh, scale <coughs> and that thermal throttling on the, on the thermal imaging camera is set to. Advantages, it can highly increase your situational awareness. Uh, you as the crew leader or the captain, if you have that uh, tip with you when you're operating at the windowsill of a VES uh, event, you are able to communicate with that firefighter if they can't see, hey, uh, firefighter Moore, I think I see something in that corner uh, towards the Bravo Charlie corner there. Why don't you uh, make your way that way? Go left instead of going right when you make your search to isolate that flow path. Uh, you can improve your visibility in an obscured environment, of course. It's really good at doing that. It can give you additional information. It can locate victims, seat of the fire, or hidden fires. Of course, it's a good overhaul tool, uh, but we can also use that to find the seat of the fire. And again, communicate that with other crews because we are focused on search. Limitations to the tick. It doesn't see through things. It's not x-ray vision. It does not detect people behind or under furniture or that are on the opposite side of the wall. It cannot see through water, glass, or reflective surface. Uh, so you're going to see some limitations there. And uh, there are also limitations in its ability to see fires or hot spots because of the things that are between. So in this specific example, carpet above a fire floor, that heat may not have radiated through that carpet enough to cause that carpet to be hot enough because of the insulating properties of that carpet. Um, so it may or may not be able to detect, it, to detect that. Uh, however, as the structural members become more involved, it may be more apparent. But there's definitely a difference between what that floor looks like with the carpet on it and without the carpet on it when you're looking through a tick. You can notice that with area rugs in particular, so be wary of that. Uh, always consult the manufacturer's documentation for uh, use and limitation and requirements of that. If you reference NFPA 1408 and NFPA 1801, you can find out more specifically how that relates to uh, the fire service and our structural operations. Uh, as far as maintenance goes, inspect it after every use, replace the batteries as needed. If it has removable batteries, um, some agencies have ticks that just are on truck mounted chargers and there is uh, no external batteries, it's a, sealed, it's a sealed battery, or it's one that's not quick change accessible. Make sure that they're clean. Most things in the fire service are designed to be wet and clean with a mild detergent. Um, so consult manufacturer documentation for how to clean that, but you don't want to let it get nasty and, and 
potentially have it impact its ability to function. Report damage or malfunction immediately. Uh, we here are familiar with writing defects for equipment, so for our agency, that may, the may, that may be the way that we go about that, but other agencies may differ. Uh, don't rely on that tool to rely upon, uh, don't rely, excuse me, on that tool to provide all the information that you uh, think that you need about a fire. It's not a replacement for your senses or observations, and it may fail on your fire conditions. So we talked about not failing or not falling into the trap of using it as a replacement for your senses. Uh, we talked about that on EMS calls too, to make that a, a reference that, that may make that connection in your brain. Uh, we treat the patient, not necessarily the machine. So uh, if we are taking a blood pressure and we get a really, really, really high number, but they're exhibiting a symptom other than that, you're going to want to treat that blood pressure that you've got. Or the, if, conversely, if the monitor says they have a really low blood pressure, but you take a manual and you need to understand that that machine is causing a limitation there, you have manually taken that and realized that that's not accurate. So your take is not the end all be all in any situations. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Firefighter Hines, can you tell me what a firefighter might do to prepare themselves for search and rescue operations? Be in contact with your officer or your incident commander to know where you're entering, where you're supposed to go. Make sure that you know what your assignment is before making entry into the IDLH. Excellent answer. Uh, Captain Roberts, can you give me uh, one example of a tool that you might use in search and rescue operations? Tape. Very good. Let's move on and talk about the equipment that we use uh, in our jurisdiction for search and rescue operations because while some of those things are, are consistent, not all of them are, so uh, we talked about, there's one thing we talked about, we talked about ropes uh, in, re in regards to search. What do we have in this agency that we use for search and rescue that other agencies may not have on our trucks? White area search rope, exactly. So we will get into a little bit uh, more about that later, but uh, let's go. Let's get there when we get there. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. But great answer. That's a piece of equipment that we use specifically in our jurisdictions that other agencies may or may not use. So for uh, your own personal safety in a search, uh, don't enter the structure when a supervisor. Excuse me. Don't enter a structure when a survivor is not likely to be found. So referencing this photo right here, uh, it is highly unlikely that we're going to find a tenable victim in that very intenable environment. Uh, closed doors to create a protected area and avoid creating additional slow paths. We've talked about safe havens. We're going to talk about BES as we progress through this uh, presentation, but we'll hit it again here. Make sure that we're closing doors and isolating flow paths. Maintain control of exterior doors to control ventilation. Uh, as the officer, Captain Roberts, uh, you'll uh, have a really good insight here. When you're making an exterior 360 and we see a wide open door with smoke billowing out, what might we do on our 360? Close the door, isolate the flow path. Exactly. We might close that door and isolate that flow path. <clears throat> There's a possibility of rapid fire development. Don't attempt any entry until the coordinated fire attack teams and ventilation have been implemented. So uh, if we see this thing about to light off, we have really turbulent smoke. It's charged, it's really thick and black. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that uh, we have a fire attack team ready to go and ventilation that's coordinated with fire attack before we're going to put ourselves in that environment. Don't freelance, uh, either as a crew or as an individual. Don't go off on your own without your crew. And as a crew, don't choose to, I don't know, salvage and overhaul as opposed to search. Do what you're assigned to do. Maintain radio contact with the incident commander. We do that before, during, and after our tactical events. Uh, monitor radio traffic for information or changes in our orders. That really falls more on the officer to, to be abreast of changes in the evolution. Uh, monitor fire conditions. We, that goes all the way back to one of the very first slides. We talk about looking at the smoke conditions, feeling for the heat conditions, things like that. Uh, and then use uh, of the department's personal accountability system. We don't do uh, accountability tags like some agencies do. Uh, we have rosters that are printed off every day for our shift commanders, so they know who's supposed to be on what truck. So as long as the officer of that crew has integrity and uh, accountability of his crew, we know who's in that crew. Uh, so we don't need to use external uh, tools like accountability tags. Uh, understand where you entered versus where you're going to exit. Uh, Firefighter Moore talked about uh, windows being potentially used as a secondary means of egress. If you found yourself on the second floor, or even the first floor, if it was an elevated first floor, with a little bit of a grade change in the yard. Wear your full PPE, including your SCBA. Uh, for agencies that don't have pass devices integrated into their SCBAs, make sure that you're wearing an external pass device. Uh, work in teams of two or more, never work by yourself. 
Always remain in visual, uh, physical, visual, or local contact. We specifically mentioned that, Captain Roberts did earlier. If you encounter fire, close the door and report the condition because we're very adamant that we control flow paths and isolate safe havens from the isolation environment. And we search systematically. We're going to talk about some of those different search patterns a little bit later. Uh, when the visibility is limited, stay low and move cautiously. If I walk into the structure and smoke is at my chest level and I can't see anything, it would be uh, not very smart of me to continue to walk. I should be moving down to a point where I can see, and my suspicion is that heat conditions may also force me down if that's the environment. It may not, but uh, it probably will at some point if it doesn't. Uh, monitor the structural integrity, communicate changes. Again, that goes way back to the very beginning here. We talked about spongy floors, visible sagging, and communicating with that. Uh, command, this is fire attack. Uh, be advised, I've got a significant change in the feeling of this floor in here. I'm concerned that we've got uh, impingement on structural members below us. Can we have that looked into? Can we have fire attack teams redistribute their efforts or, or re-target uh, their efforts? Mark entry doors. Remember the direction that you turn to go in. We're going to cover the marking system uh, very briefly here later. When visibility is obscured, uh, maintain contact with a wall, hose line, or search line. We call that an oriented search. Uh, so we'll talk about oriented search techniques a little bit later. Um, have a staff charge hose line available when working on the fire floor or the fire uh, floors or the floors immediately above or below that fire floor. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to leave our hose line uh, or have an, un an unstaffed hose line. That's not really good to anybody if it's two floors below you or one floor below you and you're operating above that fire floor. Uh, coordinate with the incident commander and ventilation teams before creating exterior openings. So if we are going to make a rescue and we are going to rescue ourselves, you may mention to that incident commander, hey, you know, in your mayday alarm, I'm going to be breaching a window on what I think is the Charlie side. Be advised of the potential impacts this may have on our, our interior operations. Um, when you are searching and your search is complete, notify that supervisor of any rooms that could not be searched. Our search is complete. We've searched approximately 50% of the structure. Uh, the Alpha and Bravo corners of that structure have not been completed so that we can get another crew in there to make that search. Report promptly to the supervisor once the search is complete, whether it is complete by your definition or their definition. If they ordered a search of the first floor and you only completed the first half, communicate that, that your search is complete because you're exiting, or the search is incomplete we're exiting, or if you finish, the search is complete, we found X or Y. Okay. Mm. <laughs> we're talking about fire. Safety guidelines for search and rescue operations. So, um, instead of uh, recalling on you to list five, right here, right now, let's talk about some of those, rehash some of those real quick, because there's a lot of them here, and we've, we've done a lot of talking here. So, we'll just rehash some of these. So, wear full PPE, including our SCBA and our PAS device. We'll search systematically. We're going to stay low and move cautiously when visibility is limited. Uh, Firefighter Moore, let's hear one, one more off this list. Uh, continuously monitor the structure's integrity and communicate the changes. Very good. What what might be one change in the structural integrity? Uh, bowing ceilings and sagging floors and walls kind of doing this. Very good, very good. Uh, Firefighter Hines, what's uh, one more guideline that we may keep in mind with our uh, search safety? Making sure to mark entry doors and remember the direction that you started your searching. Outstanding. Very good. Thank you. Isolating the fire, it needs to be a priority before we make any searches. So, uh, as a matter of fact, we even have a tactic that specifically talks about isolating. It's uh, VES, BEIS, depending on how you want to talk about it. Uh, vent, enter, search, or vent, enter, isolate, search. Uh, the operative word being isolating. So, the big thing that we're looking for here is isolating the fire, because we're isolating the flow path, and we're isolating that IDLH environment from any potential victims. We can accomplish that in a number of ways. Uh, entering the search provides ventilation. Opening. I understand that. So, uh, another one of those operative words in VES, ventilate. So, we're going to be entering the structure by ventilating it or unintentionally ventilating it by entering. And then, ensuring the fire doesn't spread needs to be a very high priority. So, uh, when we talk about the VES strategy, the very first thing you do after you make that ventilation hole is you isolate that flow path so that the fire does not or limits the spread. So, that's obviously very important. Marking systems. Um, so some agencies do this, some don't. Um, I, 
you are limited to what materials you have on you when you make this. I wouldn't necessarily expect uh, someone in a smoke-charged IDLH environment to have uh, a grease pen on them when they make this, but if you were doing a search of a large structure that didn't necessarily have uh, charged smoke from floor to ceiling, or maybe it was a situation where uh, it's uh, maybe there's an explosion and we've got a whole entire floor building to check, this may come in handy. So when you enter the room, you'll make a single slash on that door or on the wall right outside that door. You are going to take note of some things. You're going to note uh, what time you went in, what time you exited, the hazards that you find inside that room, the total victims still inside the structure. So uh, we talk about uh, rescues and things like that. So if we're sheltering in place, we may still have victims inside that structure. They may be safe. They just need to be taken out. But for now, the situation is tenable. So uh, we've got two live and three dead still inside that structure, inside that compartment. Whatever the situation dictates here. And then your search team name, so that might be Quint 7, Quint 6, Quint 5, Ladder 1, Ladder 2, what have you. Make sure that you make that marking there. So we are going to use the marking system whenever we do our practical evolution today. I'm not going to worry about actually marking it up, but we're going to verbalize making that slash making our search, coming out, and finishing that marking. So uh, try to soak that in as much as you can. Um, and again, we're going we're gonna to make sure that you understand all the pieces of the car stuff before we go through that exercise. What marking system does the Columbia Fire Department use for search and rescue operations? Is there one? It's the exact same one. Yes. It is. For, uh, yes. Although I would contend that we don't necessarily do that for like primary search of fire. Mm -hmm. But we do carry those cards for when we do shoring up like a, a structural collapse or some type of uh, natural disaster type event where we're going to be doing wide area or large searches, uh, room to room, building to building, encompassing large areas. Absolutely, we do use that FEMA marking system. Uh, so uh, bear in mind that we don't necessarily use that on house fires here, but we do use that on certain events. Primary search. And again, remember we talked about our objectives earlier. One of our objectives is to be able to perform a primary search. Uh, we're going to be rapidly determining the location of victims. It's going to be fast but thorough. This is going to be before or during fire suppression. So this is going to be while things are happening. Primary search. We're going to quickly check known or likely victim locations in all the affected areas. Fire conditions and reports. Uh, we're going to check fire conditions and we're going to report any changes that we find. We're going to always work in teams of two and maintain uh, what three points of contact? We've said this several times now. Visual, verbal, and physical. Outstanding. So uh, likely victim locations. So uh, where are we likely to find uh, victims in house fires? Bedrooms. Very good. Bedrooms. Uh, and then what uh, structural component of a room do we often find people near or in front of? Doors. Doors. Very good. So we talked about our primary search. We're looking for known or likely victim locations. We're going to check the whole room, at least as best we can, staying oriented and trying to stay anchored to something. Uh, but we are going to be expecting to find victims in certain places. We usually find people near or in front of doors or behind doors or in closets, uh, our children sometimes hide from fire, so we're going to be looking at places that a child could hide themselves in, under a bed, in a closet, things like that. And then no victim locations. Mom comes out in the front yard, she says, my daughter's still inside the house. She was sleeping, her bedroom's upstairs, turn left. Now we know, as the fire attack team, or I'm sorry, as the search team, rather, uh, that we have a no victim location that we are going to make a make or break effort to go make that rescue. Your secondary search is going to be slow and thorough, and it's going to be conducted after the fire is under control. And we're going to just double check and make sure that we didn't miss anything during the primary search. It's often conducted by personnel different than the primary search. Does anybody know why that is? It's a fresh set of hands and eyes. Exactly. Uh, if you, as a primary search crew, search, for instance, this room, and you found nothing, uh, your bias is going to be, we've already checked that room, there's nothing in there. So when you come through for a secondary search, you'd be like, yeah, I already checked that corner. I already checked that corner. We're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Whereas another crew that's never seen that room before is going to be much more granular in their assessment of that room because they've never seen it before. 
So whenever possible, we're going to try to change those crews up for primary versus secondary search. We're going to use those same systematic steps as the primary search. Uh, we're not going to remove our SUBA until it's been determined safe to do so. Uh, we can do that through air monitoring. Um, is probably the most likely method we're going to use there with our CGMs to uh, determine what the uh, percentages and proportions of IDLH gases are inside that space. Um, Captain Roberts, can you tell me the difference between a primary search and a secondary search? I don't know. Okay, so let's talk about that. So if I was going to describe a primary search, would I describe it as uh, fast and thorough, or would I describe it as slow and methodical? Fast and thorough. I would agree. Uh, primary search is going to be our very fast and thorough search. If we're not leaving anything behind, we're not, not checking anything, but we're on also wasting time. We've got other rooms to check, and we want to make sure that we cover this as fast as possible. So, very good. Uh, search methods, the different departments have different procedures. Uh, we've got oriented search, wide area search, and then search using thermal imagers, just to name a few. Uh, our agency uh, uses all three of those in different capacities. So we talked about patterns earlier, now we're going to kind of get into what that actually means. So if someone talks about a left-hand search pattern, it means they're going to enter the structure and they're going to stay anchored. So when they enter, they're going to go left. They're going to stay anchored on that left and then anytime they come to a room, they're going to search left until they hit a wall, make a right, make a right, make a right, so that three rights make a left and you end up back out there and then you continue down the hallway and done your left-handed search. If you're searching uh, the fire floor, you're going to go as close to the fire as you can and then work back towards the entrance. The reason for that is that your most likely situation to have uh, IDLH environments and compromised victims is going to be closer to that fire compartment than farther away from it. And that's the simple physics at work here. The smoke is going to be more uh, concentrated, more aggressive, and the oxygen displacement is going to be much more significant nearest the fire than it is by the time it diffuses and dissipates and gets a little further in that structure. Proceed as directly as possible from the entry to, to reach a point nearest the fire. Uh, so if we know the fire when we enter the structure is straight across the room that way, we're not necessarily going to take two rooms to get over there. We're going to go straight there if the conditions allow for that. If we saw floors sagging and we saw structural members collapsing, we and we know we're on the second floor, we're not necessarily going to go across that unsafe space. But if we're on a slab and there's a space over there to search, we're going to go right to it, as long as there's nothing that tells us not to. A hose line or a search line can provide a way to remain oriented. If we take the hose with us, we've got the protection of a hose line, we've got water. We've also got a way out. We can follow our couplings, uh, smooth bump bump leads to the pump, and we can also use a uh, search line, our uh, wide area search rope that has our rings and our knots at different intervals so that we know how far we are and how much rope we have left. When we talk about two search teams or one search team, you can see there's obviously a very clear difference here. So on our two search team, uh, one team is obviously making a left-hand search, and one is obviously making a right-hand search. This is obviously going to be very effective in an apartment or a hotel type situation, nursing home, anywhere that has a long stretch of a lot of compartmentalizations. So that situation lends itself very well to that. A one search team is oftentimes what you're limited to when you're talking about a single alarm response to a structure fire. Because you may only have one company on scene that's available to make a search, and that may be all you have at that moment. So a one search team is going to do the same thing. They're going to make their search whatever pattern they determine before they go in, but they've got the added responsibility of searching more space. So when they reach the end of that hallway, maybe say in that, in that hotel, they need to make a loop and come back the other way and search all those rooms. What is a disadvantage to the one search team method? It takes a lot longer and you have to team. Exactly. It takes longer. Two teams can do that in half the time. You're going to be very tired by the time you search your one, two, three, four, fifth, sixth, seventh room, assuming that's even all of it is. And what's the finite resource that we have with us? Air. air. So we may not even have enough air to make a search of eight rooms and still make it out of the structures we talked about knowing your limit, what's your point of no return. I can tell you, for me personally, uh, searching that seventh room here, that might be about my point of no return. Because if I'm making thorough, quick searches of these rooms, and we're in an IDLH environment, and I'm crawling around, 
I may be near my limit to make that search and still get out if we find something. Make sure that you control your egress passage, uh, passageways. One firefighter at the door of the search room can control the door. If they have a thermal imaging camera, they can also make a sweep of that room and alert you to anything that there may be there. Uh, close doors to adjacent rooms after they're searched. Again, limiting that fire spread and controlling those flow paths. Position the hose teams to cool, to cool accumulated gases, if so necessary. Get low to the floor to perform a survey. Uh, we talk about this a lot when we talk about BES evolutions. We come in through that window, we sound the floor, and then as soon as we come in, we do our what? We do our live fire layout. We get as close to the floor as we can, and we look across the room to A, identify where the door is so that we can isolate the flow path, because we haven't talked about that enough today. And we also were able to see if there's victims or what other things there are that we might be encountering inside that room. If there's minimal smoke, there's no problem walking up right. You don't need to handicap yourself. Uh, I think that we reflexively get in the habit of getting on our hands and knees and, and doing everything because that's what we do in the academy, because we're always training ourselves for the hardest situation possible. Heavy fire, heavy smoke, you're on the floor, you're crawling around. Well, don't let yourself fall into the habit of always crawling if there's no need to crawl, because what's faster than crawling? Walking. If there's no need to crawl, don't crawl. Uh, on the contrary to that, don't be so cavalier that if you are in a situation where the smoke conditions do dictate that maybe I should be on my hands and knees, that you get on your hands and knees. Just as we talked about right here. Searching methods, uh, we can find victims, uh, egress where they might be seeking shelter. We talked about uh, near doors, they could be near windows, maybe they tuckered out right in front of that window. We're going to search the perimeter of each room. We're going to reach under the beds and furniture. Again, we talked about children hiding places sometimes. Uh, or maybe a, an adult may be going underneath the bed because they know that uh, heat rises and some of that more tenable atmosphere may be underneath that bed. So we're always going to look there. Place a tool against the wall and extend your arm or leg to search the middle of the room. That's just extending your footprint. So if you anchor yourself off of your halogen bar, which is 36 inches, and then you anchor off of that, you've given yourself an extra three feet towards the middle of that room. We'll talk about that when we do our practical evolutions. Limited visibility. Uh, gloves take away dexterity. Practice touching things with your gloves. Uh, you may need to touch things to identify them and what type of room you're in. So if you're feeling around and you feel uh, wooden slats at above your eye level, you may be thinking this might be a baby's room. Maybe that's a crib I'm dealing with here. If you felt that somewhere else, you might not know what situation you're in. Uh, so be weary. I went through what looks like a bedroom and I'm feeling what seems like it could be a crib. So what am I going to do? I'm going to check in, I'm going to check under, and I'm going to move on. If I don't find anything, we're going to move on. It's a quick, rapid search, but it's thorough. Uh, don't move objects. Uh, I would say that maybe ties in a little bit with fire investigative properties. Um, I would say a caveat to that would be uh, if you need to move something out to search behind it. I don't think there's any reason that you couldn't move a bed frame to maybe get underneath it if you really had to. Uh, but uh, I guess put it back when you're done. Uh, report obscured vision condition to the incident commander. That, I think, goes along with just the continuing communicative process that we have between crews and the incident commander. Visibility is low. Visibility is great. We need ventilation to improve visibility, so on and so forth. You're going to use the TIC, operate within the SOPs of your department, uh, scan at the floor level, and then a higher level uh, search beneath and behind furniture, because again, that tech does not see through that. We know that. That's a property of the thermal imaging camera. Open the doors to scan inside closets and cabinets. Uh, keep in mind, the screen may white out and detect a high level of heat. Let that thermal imaging camera adjust itself and assess and set a new relativity so that it can set a new baseline so that now differently colored objects show up differently. It may take it a second to do that. Maintain uh, radio contact and report your progress. Uh, you know, this is Quint 7. We've uh, finished search of two bedrooms on the third floor. We still have two bedrooms to go. Air status is uh, you know, one room. Closed doors, uninvolved rooms. Why would we do that? I said flow path. Very good. Very good. Uh, clear any unused hose lines or equipment from egress passageways. Uh, that just is, it falls under good housekeeping, I suppose. Uh, to orient yourself during a search, uh, the whole purpose of an oriented search is to anchor yourself to something that you know what it is. These firefighters have one guy stationed at the door, and we've got firefighters that have feet against the wall, 
so that they are in contact with the wall, which we know is near the firefighter at the door. If you can find the wall, you can find your way out, because the doors are on the wall. It's pretty simple. Uh, we've also got uh, the ability to use uh, search ropes. Uh, you'll see this uh, crew here is attached their search rope about 10 feet outside the structure, and they're operating inside the structure. Uh, we've got personnel that are in different roles here. We've got searchers that are on the line. We've got uh, the guy leading the charge. We've got our navigator with a tick. With our wide area search ropes, uh, they all have to have certain functions and features. So as you see on this example here, We've got a rope that's 100 feet long, and it's got a ring every 20 feet. And what it also has is it has a knot that corresponds to how many feet deep you are. So at 20 feet, we've got a ring in one knot with 20 feet. At 40 feet, we've got a ring in two knots, so we're two sets of 20 feet in. At 60 feet, we've got three, net, three knots, which indicates we're three times 20, 60 feet in, so on and so forth. So we get to our 100 foot. But we've got five knots, which indicates that we've got five sets of 20 feet, so we're at 100 feet inside that structure. Uh, we've got some other additional search methods here. Uh, we've got someone that's oriented here on that rope, and then we've got someone on that line that's branched off, and they're searching that way. You can see they've got a long tool to sweep to increase their, their ability to feel things and sweep for victims. We've got the VEIS method. Uh, we've talked about that briefly earlier. So it means vents. Isolate, enter, and search. So here, when you look at this uh, scenario here, we've got a ideal H environment with a victim in the closet here. We make a ventilation opening, which causes that uh, ideal H gas to seek the passive leaf resistance, which is outside. It's going to charge outside. Our firefighter is going to go in and isolate that flow path by closing that door. Then we're going to make that rescue. And then we're going to bring them out, and then we're going to figure out what to do from there. Whether that needs to be additional personnel to make that rescue, or what, our purposes for getting them have completed. We found our victim by using the VEIS method. We're going to do uh, this whenever there's possible victims in a survivable area. You would not VES a flashing compartment. So if we uh, saw a second story window with fire blowing out, and the entire compartment was alight. We're not going to VEIS that compartment because uh, we're not going to survive and there's nothing surviving in that room. However, right next to that compartment, there may be a tenable space. We talk about searching close to the fire. So our VES uh, tactic in that situation may be going to the window next to the one that's fully involved because that's probably the next room to be fully involved and there may still be someone there. We've probably all seen the photos online, uh, the bedroom that had the door closed in a fully involved house fire. Minimal smoke damage, minimal charring inside, a small hollow core door made all the difference. So just because it's right next to a fully involved structure, or a compartment rather, doesn't mean that we can't start right there. We should only initiate that, we should only initiate that tactic after the size up, when you know we're getting into, when you know what our plan of attack is. Um, uh, and I think we've, we've pretty well covered that. Crew integrity is the key to successfully completing this. Verbal or physical contact is necessary to allow the searcher to leave through the entry point. Uh, when we practice this as crews, we always leave someone at that windowsill, directing that member inside, go shut that door, make that search, get that victim to me. Uh, Firefighter Moore, uh, well, how can a thermal imager aid us in search operations? It can allow us to see heat differences to potentially recognize victims in a room. So, can also give us what kind of room we're in. Like you can kind of see structures a little bit with heat differences. So you can say I'm in a bedroom, there may be somebody on the bed, you may be able to see somebody on the bed, or a, a silhouette of something on the bed, and you can say, hey, go over there. Awesome, excellent answer. Uh, difference between a wide area search and oriented search, we touched on that. Uh, that's where you might anchor yourself to a wall. We know what and where that is, and we're going to search off of that because the visibility is so low that we can't see where we are. Uh, Firefighter Hines, uh, can you tell me what the VEIS acronym is? Uh, ventilate, Enter, Isolate, Search. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Uh, let's see. A situation that might require the use of an oriented search technique. Uh, Captain Roberts? Um, you're entering several small rooms that you can go through pretty quick that you have to orient against a wall. I would, I would totally agree with that. Thank you very much. 
Um, and then how about one more? Let's have a situation that required the use of a wide area search technique. Right if you yeah. had low visibility in a big area, like let's say a school cafeteria, where yeah. you can't just orient yourself on the wall, you have to extend yourself out to the middle of the room. Outstanding answer. That's a, that's a perfect answer to that question. Thank you very much. Uh, we're here. For, we've arrived at our last objective of the day. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, victim removal methods. Uh, the lecture portion of this is minimal because we're going to be, be doing most of the doing out here when we do this. So we've got uh, victim self-evacuation. Uh, this is where we're going to assist occupants. We're not necessarily going to be doing the rescuing. So we might direct someone to an alternate exit. Hey, don't go that way. We've got firefighters set up here. I need you to go this way. All the way to the end of the hall. Go to that door. We've got personnel there. You're going to shelter in place. Close doors to maintain integrity of the exit path. And establishing a safe haven. There's that word safe haven again. We talked about that previously. Uh, uh, firefighter more. What duty might a firefighter have if a victim is able to self-evacuate? What might they tell them to do? Go through a specific path. Um, I mean, if we're set up in like a stairwell or something, and we need them to go down this specific stairwell because we got fire tag in another, and we need to kind of give them directions on how to get out from where we're at. So if we're at the top, you need to go down, take a left, go out. I would totally agree with that. Excellent answer. Thank you. Shelter in place, we use when the hazard's minor, when it's safer to keep someone inside and maybe more logistically uh, sound. Victims are incapacitated and can't be moved. We've got limited staffing. And the structure itself can provide a protective barrier between the victim and the hazard. So we see this in hospitals and nursing homes, correctional facilities, high rises, high hazard industrial sites. And the reason that we see them there is because they all share uh, something in common, and that's their construction type. So they're either going to be non-combustible or fire resistant. Um, so we can put someone in a safe haven because the structural components of that building itself are not going to burn. So even though we may have a hazard that needs to be mitigated, we don't have the logistical ability to move 25 hospital beds on one floor to a stairwell. We can't necessarily do that. But if we can set up shop and prevent that fire spread, we can enable us to use that space as a safe haven and maybe use that floor as a safe haven or if we do have books that can move, we can move them to a safe haven that's maybe not out of the building, but maybe just move 20 feet. I need to, we need to get these people down to this pressurized stairwell so we can put them there. That's a safe haven for us. So you're going to see that in buildings that have fire resistant or fire or non-combustible uh, structure uh, construction. Uh, that would be an example of shelter in place. We've got this area of refuge here amongst a pretty untenable environment. Uh, let's see here, Captain Roberts, what type of situation would dictate sheltering in place instead of an outright evacuation? Uh, when you have a, uh, maybe a large area that have several people in it that are incapacitated or not easily moved, and a building that allows the opportunity for you to isolate certain areas or shelter them in place instead of moving them up. Thank you, that's a, that's a very apt answer. Uh, victim removal techniques, uh, we're going to, again, harken back to our objectives here. We're going to talk about some different techniques for our firefighter one and two skills. We're going to remove people whenever the conditions prevent self-evacuation or sheltering in place, so we have to take an action because they're directly threatened. The firefighter duties are going to be to extinguish any fire that's cut them off from an exit if you have a charge hose line, provide an alternate exit pathway, take debris off a pinned victim, or carry an injured or unconscious victim to safety. So we're going to do that by moving them. We shouldn't uh, move them until we've assessed or treated them unless they're in danger. So in the relative scope of structural firefighting, uh, they may be threatened and in danger, so we may move them rapidly. But if we are not in a situation where the situation dictates immediate removal, we may take that time to assess that patient. But again, we're not, gonna, we're not going to assess the patient at the expense of getting them out of the structure. Don't pull them sideways. Um, why, why might we not pull a victim sideways? You're creating more surface area when you're pulling them versus if they were you know, more vertical, you could fit into tighter spaces. There's less surface area on the ground if you're picking them up and dragging them versus those, trying to pick up their whole body and drag it. Those are two very, very good points. Turning this guy sideways is going to make create a huge problem from A, the surface area, that we've got in contact with the floor, and then when we get to that door, it's not going to happen. That guy's not going to make it to that door uh, without having to do some major readjustments. Take that time to orient that victim 
longitudinally with the door, I suppose would be the way to describe that. And use proper lifting techniques. Uh, lift as a team. Focus on keeping your balance. Support the head and the neck. Uh, avoid unnecessary jostling. Don't drag them through the hazards unless there's no other choice. And this is all, I have this opportunity. If there's no option to avoid unnecessarily jostling, we're not going to not make that rescue because we couldn't avoid the jostling. That's just part of it. But if you can, avoid unnecessary jostling. Uh, so these are the three uh, removal techniques that we're going to practice today. We're going to practice the incline drag, the extremity lift, and the webbing drag. Obviously, we've got other options too, the cradle and arms, the seat <coughs> lift, and the litter carry. But again, we're going to be focusing on these three for our Firefighter 1 practical seals today. Uh, let's see, uh, Firefighter Moore, what is one uh, removal method that we can use to remove a victim from a hazardous situation? Maybe one of the three that we're going to practice today. Webbing drag. Perfect. Very good. All right, so we've reached the end of our, of our presentation here. I'm going to bri briefly summarize. So we talked about firefighter survival. We talked about understanding uh, how to keep yourself cool in a, in a high heat situation, literally and figuratively. We talked about keeping your wits about you with air. We talked about uh, maybe some ways to shelter in place and identify safe havens. We talked about structural search itself. We talked about search methods, search techniques, being oriented. We talked about victim removal. We talked about uh, when to remove people versus when not to remove people. And we've talked about uh, some techniques that we're going to go over here in a little more detail. Do we have any questions about this material before we move on to our assessment of this course? Okay, wonderful. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to issue a brief 10-question assessment. For the sake of academic integrity, I'm going to ask Firefighter Moore to go to the table behind you. Firefighter Hines and Captain Roberts, you guys can stay where you are. Um, I've established uh, reasonable guidelines for academic integrity here. Uh, I'm going to administer the tests. I'm going to ask that you guys take your exams uh, and turn them into me when you're finished, and then please exit the room, and then I will score them with the provided rubric to prevent any potential uh, testing or grading bias, and then I will call you in individually one-on-one -on -one to discuss your assessment and evaluation and uh, provide any coaching or feedback that I can. So, I've got a structural search and rescue test for you. Please uh, name and date these if you don't mind. You'll have uh, 30 minutes to complete this.
So at this time, I'm going to grade these tests that were administrated uh, with appropriate accommodations for academic integrity uh, with this rubric so that I avoid any potential testing or grading bias. And then I will uh, individually meet with these students one-on-one -on -one to ensure that they have the proper coaching and feedback if necessary. So Captain Roberts uh, scored 10 out of 10 uh, questions correct on this. So I've indicated on here uh, 10 out of 10 with 100%. Also bear in mind that I would not be uh, verbally stating test scores where there are actually students out here. But for the sake of demonstration for the video, I'm indicating that I've recorded the score on the testing sheet. I will then record it on the student uh, uh, course training record as well. And I will share this feedback with him individually. I'll repeat this process for all three students. So all three of my exams have been graded. Uh, I will now call them in one by one to discuss their individual scores and performances for the written test. And then make the records in the uh, training record. I'm also going to allow for privacy by ensuring that other students uh, do not find out what the other students got. These test scores will remain confidential. communicate with you that you uh, scored 10 points out of 10 points correctly. You received 100% on this examination. I can tell that you are grasping the material and I appreciate your attention to detail today. I'm going to hold on to this test. If you would please grab Firefighter Hines and have him report to me. Sure. Firefighter Hines, you scored uh, 10 points out of 10 points possible on this exam. You received 100%. Uh, it's very evident to me that you are grasping the material, and I appreciate your attention uh, and willingness to answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, if you would not mind uh, getting Captain Roberts for me, I would like to discuss uh, his with him. Thank you, Engineer Rush. You can enter Captain Roberts. Uh, 
wanted to inform you that you scored uh, 10 points out of 10 possible points <clears throat> on this quiz. You scored 100%. Uh, it's very evident to me that you are engaged and paying attention during these lectures. Uh, I appreciate your uh, willingness to answer questions, and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. You're dismissed. So I've completed the grading process. Uh, I'm now going to record these grades and the training record so that we can submit this uh, through the appropriate uh, jurisdictional chain of command to make sure that these are filed away appropriately. At this point, I'm going to pause the video so that we can move towards the practical skills evolution portion of this event.